I want you to find the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, now that's easy because you have Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. If you're joining us on FATV, welcome. You're welcome to join us uh, any Sabbath, which is Saturdays that we meet here at 10 o'clock uh, here at 40 Bowtell Street. The book of Ecclesiastes, we don't spend too much time in that book. Amen? <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to, uh, did I say chapter 1? I mean chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Those of you who um, are old enough to think back to the uh, time of the uh, hippie movement and all that will recognize this as, as the, the, a song that was sung back then. People were running around singing the Bible, didn't even know it. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time for everything. I won't sing the rest of it. Let's go at, uh, at verse 1. There is a time for everything. Say time for everything. And a season for every activity under heaven. A season. Now that word season is very important. Because the time for everything does not refer to a time like at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Talks about a time to be born and a time to die. And, and, and you know, there's no appointed time in terms of a date and hour. That confronts most people's uh, view of how they think, well, you know, when your time's up, your time's up. That's just not true. There is a season. Amen. But there, there's a uh, time isn't defined that way in the Hebrew here. There is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, in a time for peace. I want you to look at verse 7. It says there is a time to be silent and there is a time to speak. A time to be silent and time to speak. And if we get those mixed up, then we're speaking when we should be silent. And we're silent when we should be speaking. Amen? You're out of season. You're out of season. If you're speaking when it's a time to be silent, you're out of season. If you're silent when you should be speaking, you're out of season. You're out of sync with the plan of God. You know, uh, when I was in the military academy, uh, they taught us all how to march. They do in anything, but you, you learn to march. And if you're out of step, you know, one of the cadet captains would simply yell at you, Long, get in step. And what did you do if you were out of step? You skipped step. In fact, Jordan and I liked to, used to like to do that, you know, and, and, and I'd go along and see if I could outskip step her, you know, and she'd come along with me, and I'd skip a step, and then I'd skip it, and then I'd do three skips of a step, you know, and she always kept pace with me. But we had, a, uh, we had a young man in our platoon who was very interesting. He was always half a step out. <laughs> and, and every time in that summer when we were practicing, they were always yelling at him. And, you know, and I mentioned to my cadet leader at one point, he says, his, his challenge is that he's half a step out. And he said, what do you mean? I said, when he skips step, he's still out of step. You see, all the heads are going up and down like this together as you march along, except his head's like this, you know. And it, it's not that, so yell at him, skip step, well, he'd skip step, but he's still half a step. Amen. And we've got to be careful that we don't get arrogant. It's like the mother who is watching the parade of soldiers after World War II and they're coming through the town and they're, they're parading by and she jabs one of her neighbors and says, look, they're all out of step except my son John. <laughs> no, it's John who's out of step. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. There's a time to be silent and a time to speak. If you're speaking when you're supposed to be silent, you're out of step with God. And if you're silent when you should be speaking you're out of step with God. Amen? And Christians err on both sides of that. <laughs> on both sides of that. Amen? If you're speaking negative, you're always out of sequence with God. Amen? That's a time to be silent. Amen? If, if the doctor gives you a bad report and you go telling everybody, you're out of step with 
Come on, you're out of step with God. That's a time to be silent. Don't give words to it. Don't give it any life. Life is in the words, just don't give words to it. Amen? But I want to first start by looking at a time that was absolutely required for silence. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Just keep turning to the right beyond Ecclesiastes, you'll come to it. Isaiah is the big book. And Isaiah 53 is the Messianic prophecy. It's the Messianic prophecy. It's prophesying about Messiah. Verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's describing the crucifixion. God has laid on Yeshua the iniquity of us all. Verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. The Message Bible says, like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Now turn to Mark chapter 15. So that's the prophecy. The prophecy is that the coming Messiah is going to suffer the sins of the world being laid upon him. He's going to be the atoning Lamb of God. We just sang about that today. Forever you will be the Lamb upon the throne. He's your personal Lamb. Think about that. I, I was thinking as we're singing that, I've got to rewrite those words to make those personal. He's my Lamb upon the throne. That when I'm called to bring a Lamb to the, to the altar to sacrifice for my sins, well, Yeshua is my Lamb. I'm glad He's your Lamb, but boy, I'll tell you, I am blessed He's my Lamb. Amen? And we need to start, start singing that way. And so the prophecy in Isaiah about the Lamb on the throne, all this was going to be laid upon him, and it said he would be uh, silent. Mark chapter 15, verse 3. The chief pre priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Yeshua still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. They're throwing all these accusations at him, and Yeshua made no reply. It was a time for silence. Now, why was it a time for silence? Turn back to Matthew chapter 26. It was required that Yeshua be silent. It wasn't required because it was prophesied. It was prophesied because it was required. Isaiah is just prophesying what's going to happen, but the reason it happened was because this was a time for silence. There's a time for silence and there's a time to speak. Why was this a time for silence? Matthew chapter 26 Move down to verse 53. This is when Yeshua was arrested. And you remember Peter drew his sword and was ready to go fight for him and everything? Look at verse 53. Yeshua is speaking. Do you think I cannot call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Do you not think I can speak and 12 legions of angels will be at my disposal? Do you not think all I need to do is say, God help or angels be? Do, do you not think that all I need to do is open my mouth and decree it and 12 angels are there? But... How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? See, if I open my mouth and decree the angels are going to come, the crucifixion will never take place. How then is mankind going to be saved? It was a time for silence. 
all the injustice in the world around that event, the pure hypocrisy of that event, and one person in the middle of it could have changed it. He might have, if he had spoken, even changed Pilate's decision. He could have said, Pilate, they don't know what they're talking about, blah, 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 and given a defense, and Pilate would say, I set him free. How then would you and I be saved? See, there's a time for silence, a time when if you open your mouth, you do damage to the kingdom of God. When you open your mouth and you cause the wrong thing to happen, and in this case Yeshua was silent because it was a plan of redemption that needed to be taken place. And he could not call on who he was. Who was he? Son of God. Son of the Most High. First citizen in the kingdom of heaven, if we can use that. And he could have called out, and instantly there would have been help, but had he done that, the plan of God would not have been fulfilled. A citizen of the kingdom but he could not call on his citizenship. He could not call on it. It was a time to be silent. Now, you know, a lot of times we, we come to the scriptures and we have a picture of Yeshua and we have this model that we've been given in life that we're to, we're to live out our life in all ways as Yeshua did. And that's led to some really uh, heretical kind of teaching. Because the Bible says he became poor, so we don't have to be poor. Well, he was crucified, so I don't need to be crucified. Amen? And the Bible is very clear that he took upon himself all infirmities, so that by his stripes we are healed. He paid a price. Come on. He paid a price, so you don't have to pay it. So when you stand before the judge, you stand before God, and there you are, standing by yourself at that time, pastor's not around for you. All your church buddies aren't there. You stand alone before the judge of eternity. There's going to be one standing in the wings. Hmm? Let me give you a picture of that. Tim, come on up here. Scott, come on up here. You get to be the judge. Oh, I always wanted to be the judge. There you are, and you're standing there. Okay? And now you're going to give an account for your life, but there's one standing in the wings. Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Is not, that's his name, right? The accuser of the brethren. Well, what's he there? He's there to accuse you to the judge. Amen? He's there. And so... When the judge is looking at him, in steps Satan to say, this man did this, did that, is guilty of this, he's guilty of that, he's guilty of this, and he's guilty of that. And the judge is going to ask him, how do you plead? Go ahead. He's only got one thing to plead, the blood of the lamb. He doesn't plead that I never did those things. He doesn't say, no, that's a lie, I never did it. No, 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 I didn't lie, I didn't steal, didn't do that. No, he's not there pleading he didn't do it. He's pleading the blood of the Lamb. And in the other wings is Yeshua, who comes to the Father and says, that's right, Abba. My blood was applied to his sin because he received me. And therefore... The judge only has one thing to say. You're innocent. You're cleared. You're cleared of everything. You got that? Thank you. You can sit down. That's the picture. <laughs> You're cleared. Not that you didn't do it. Not that you didn't sin. Not that you didn't sin. Come on. But that you're cleared. You're covered. Someone paid the bill. Someone paid the bill. Okay? So, as an example only, I owe Scott $1,000. Boy, he'd get excited about that because he'd know I'd pay it. 
So I owe him a thousand dollars, okay? And I'm over here, and I say, you know, boy, I, I'm I'm struggling with things, and 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 my buddy Tim says, so what's the issue? I said I owe Scott a thousand dollars. He says I'll go pay it. Go pay him. So he goes and he pays him the thousand dollars. Okay. And he says to me, he paid it. <laughs> oh, wow, my thousand dollars has been paid. Yay! And I'm walking and I see Scott the next day. And he says to me, You owe me a thousand dollars. Oh. Oh. Well, uh, uh, let me see what I can do. You know, I mean, pl please be patient with me. I don't quite. It's not how I, come on, let's, see, let's get out of religion and get into real life. What would we do? No way do I owe you a thousand dollars. Tim paid it. Yeah, but that was Tim's thousand. No, but he paid it for me. You know, I don't care what you say, how loud you get, you know, how angry you get. No, I'm, I'm not, no way. That's illegal. That's called stealing from me. No, and if somebody came up and said, and the judge said, you know, and so he takes me to court, and I'm standing there, and he says, he owes me a thousand dollars, and he agreed to it, and the judge says, did you agree to pay him a thousand dollars? I said, yes, I did, and he says, he didn't pay me. I said, no, your honor, but Tim paid my thousand for me. Oh, why didn't you say there was a Tim in the story? Huh? Because he's a liar and a, and a thief and all that. He didn't say. All of a sudden, I call my witness. I call my witness. Your Honor, here's my witness. This is Tim. He's my witness. And the judge says, did you give him a thousand dollars? Yes. Did you give it to, for, for Don Long? Yes, he did. Now all the eyes in the court are focused on you. You know, case dismissed. You're operating illegally. You're trying to impose something that was already paid. You got that picture? Okay, we're going to go somewhere with that. A time for silence. Yeshua was silence. Now, let, now let's turn to, uh, to Acts chapter 21. Now, this is where Paul went back to Jerusalem. And in Acts 21, they were, you know, trying to find out, is he really committed to, to his Jewish roots or not? And they found out he was. And uh, in fact, he paid for the... Uh, for a vow that some of the young men were taking at that time. But uh, Paul got in trouble with the crowds then because he, he brought a couple of Greek people with him in the city. They saw him with the city. They assumed, say assumed. You know, assumptions are terrible things. They, they assumed that he took those Greeks into the temple. And so the agitators in the crowd who don't like Paul because he's a believer in Yeshua stirred things up. And if we look down to about verse 30. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, say kill him. That's a pretty vicious crowd. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken to the barracks. Verse 35, when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mobs was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, away from him. Away from him. Now imagine that. Imagine being in the middle of that. You know, you... People say, I, I'm being persecuted. You don't know what persecution is. I mean, you got thousands of people around yelling to kill you, to kill you, and the soldiers come, there's the SWAT team, and they literally are forming a barrier around you, picking you up and carrying you in the middle of a phalanx of soldiers to get through the crowd so they don't tear you apart. 
verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? And then what happens then is Paul stands up and tries to explain to the crowd his whole encounter with Yeshua on the road to Damascus and what he was doing and everything. And, uh, and again, they come to a point where they get up, upset. All right? So in verse 30, <laughs> 32, 22 of chapter 22, Chapter 22, verse 22, he's already had his speech, and all that did is stir them up again. You know what stirred him up, by the way? It was when he told them that he was going to the Gentiles. They, got, you know, they did not want him going to the Gentiles. Verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned. Say flogged. flogged. Now do you know what, uh, imagine what's going on. Tim, if I can use you for a minute. They grabbed him like that and they put him down and they're ready to flog him with whips. They've got him tied out like that. I mean, how fast do you think that happened? Come on, the crowd's yelling, they're all around. The soldiers are saying, please come with me, Mr. Paul. They, I mean, they, they, as far as they're concerned, they got some kind of a, uh, so, some evil bad guy. They come him and they slap him down on that whipping post. They got his arms tied out like that. Okay, you can go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 25, as they stretched him out to flog him. By the way, do you know that in the, in the Roman army, they had professional floggers? They did. That was your job. What's your job? I'm a flogger. You know? And so you can imagine that guy's got his whip. I should have brought a whip with me. You know, here, here's his whip. You know, and they bring him in. While they're bringing him, what do you think he's doing? He's practicing. I mean, you can hear that whip cracking. It, it probably was one with multi-thongs on it, you know? They've come up, and they tie him out there, and they're ripping off his, his tunic to, to bare his back. I mean, that's bound to get your adrenaline going. Amen? And what has Paul done? If you read the story, he, he hasn't done at all what the crowds are... He hasn't done anything. He has not done anything. Okay? As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said, this is the time to be silent and just bear it and just put up with it because I'm serving my, my master and I'll take any beating for him and like a lamb led to the slaughter, I'm going to be silent. No, he didn't do that at all. No, he did not do that. Well, you know, just bear up under the, under the onslaught of the devil, you know. I don't care if he's put sickness or disease on you. Just bear up under it. Just, just you know, be silent and let's just bear up under the, the attacks that come. Is that what Paul did? No, well, read it here. You can see that guy's coming out. He's got his flog and he's getting closer. And Paul turns to the centurion standing there. Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? I've got citizenship. Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried? Notice verse 26. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported, What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. Now, I'll tell you, there's something else the commander did that's not in there. There's the flogger. Man, he is ready. Snap, snap. They got Paul already tied out there. His shirt's back, and he turns to the, the commander, and he says, is it legal to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried? And there's a guy coming with a whip, and the first thing the commander did, stop. <laughs> Whoa. You get back in your cage there, buddy. <laughs> I need to go and check this one out. 
He goes to the commander of the centurion. What are you going to do? This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. Notice that. The man, I was born a Roman citizen. Man, I don't want to be anywhere near of being found guilty of having beaten a Roman citizen. Why? If you beat a Roman citizen without a trial, you got the punishment that citizen deserved. If you beat him to death and they found out he was a Roman citizen afterwards and you were the one that beat him to death, you went to death. That was the power of Roman citizenship. The power of Roman citizenship. Boy, they backed off and said immediately they withdrew. I mean, I don't want to even be known I was on the detail that day. You know, I was the one that put his arm down there and wrapped it up on the, on the thing. Whoa, unwrap him and I leave. You know, I don't want him to see my face. I don't want him to later be able to say, he's one that tied me down. Come on. Glory to God. A absolutely amazing. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he'd put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Now, what's the difference? What's the difference? Come on. Yeshua comes and he says, I can, I can call a, a, a legion of angels. All I have to do is open my mouth and say, come, they'll come. It was a, a season for silence. Why? Because God, come on, God had a plan that required that punishment been, be met, meted out. But we're in a different season. The season of the church is not a season where Christians are supposed to be suffering. Where do we ever get that idea? Where do we ever get that idea? That our life on earth as Christians is to be, oh, well, it's filled with poverty and trials and temptations, and it's, and it's filled with all these, uh, these cancers and diseases and everything else, but hang in there, and when we get to heaven, it's all going to be better. That's not in the Bible. Show it to me in the Bible. Show it to me in the Bible. Well, I believe, I know what you believe, but show it to me in the Bible. Show me where God's will for a born again child of God is sickness and death and disease and, and all the tragedies of life. It's not there. Does it happen? Yes. But is it God's will? No. But if we don't know whose citizen we are, then we don't know what rights we have. We don't know what rights we have. What is an outlaw? An outlaw is somebody who operates outside the law. Outside the law. Do you know you can have a, a, a town government run by outlaws? <laughs> you know, people outside the law. A, 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 amen? You know, out, out in the Midwest a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, uh, there was a, a man who had run for election in a small town out there, and it was to fight corruption. That was what he was running on. And lo and behold, he identified... 21 paychecks being written out every week and, and he couldn't find out who they were going to because the town finance people wouldn't let him, the mayor, have access to those records. Money was being, was, you know, so he was going to report all this to the public on how tens of thousands of dollars every week was disappearing in the, in the city illegally and guess what the city council did? They fired the mayor and declared martial law. And now I know that won't stand up in court. I haven't followed up to see what happened. That, that's not going to stand up in court. But that's what the city council did. Why? Probably some of them were the ones who were taking the money. The outlaws were in charge of the town. And if the citizens don't exercise their rights as citizens, then the outlaws will rule. Is that not true? Well, that's outside the law. They're not supposed to do that. That's right. But who's going to enforce it? Whoever enforces the law of the rights of a citizen, if not the citizens themselves? If the outlaws are in charge and the citizens don't exercise that right, don't say, don't speak, don't change it, then guess what? It may be illegal, but it's going to happen. And that happens all over the place. I won't get in that because that's not my point for today. 
The commander arrested him, ordered him to be bound in chains, was about to beat him, to, simply to question him, but he didn't know an important fact. He had no right to do that. It's up to Paul to tell him he has no right. It's not up to the commander to know that. If Paul doesn't exercise his right, he'll be beaten. He'll be beaten. And if you and I don't know how to exercise our rights, we'll be beaten. We'll be beaten financially. We'll be beaten emotionally. We'll be beaten mentally. We'll be beaten with discouragement. We'll be beaten with, with sickness. We'll be beaten with all the things that are commonly accepted in the body of Christ if we don't know who we are and don't open our voice and say, this is a season to speak. This is a time to decree and to declare whose I am. And not let the devil just stretch me out on the events of life and beat me. Amen? Boy, anybody getting anything out of this yet? By the way, let's, let's finish with, with what was going on with Paul here. Um, down in chapter 23, turns out that uh, a bunch of the Jews had made a vow that they were going to kill Paul. And one of Paul's relatives found out about it and came and told Paul. Paul sent him off to the commander. And the, the commander now found out there's a plot in Jerusalem to kill Paul. To kill, kill Paul who? To kill Paul, the Roman citizen. Come on. There's a plot to kill Paul, the Roman citizen. Right? So what's the commander do? Chapter 23, verse... 23. Then he, the commander, called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers. Say 200 soldiers. 70 horsemen. That's the cavalry. Say 70 cavalry. And, and 200 spearsmen. Now wait a minute. 200 soldiers, 200 spearsmen, and 70 horsemen. If my math is right, that's 470. Now, wait a minute. There I am, and I, all of a sudden, we're, there's a plot to kill me. Seven or eight or ten men in the city have pledged that they'll die if trying to, to get, make sure I'm murdered. And the response of the commander is, I'm going to get you off to Caesarea. Now, those of you who've been with us, we know where Caesarea is. We've been there. You know, that Greek city, that pagan city, that Roman city. Okay? We've been there. But how did Paul arrive there? He didn't arrive there in chains. Come on. He arrived there, he was sent, and as he's leaving Jerusalem, he's got 200 soldiers, 200 spearsmen. You have 400 soldiers, and you got 70 cavalry escorting you out of the city. Huh. Woo. Ha, 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 ha. I got my private security agency of 470 armed men to protect me. Wow. What a difference. Amen? And listen, so he, uh, verse 24, 23, get, get the detachment ready to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight. Verse 24, provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. This is probably where they get the idea that Paul fell off his horse on the road to Damascus. There's no horse in that episode. But guess what? He gives him a horse. He's not even going to have to walk from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Wow. I think, I think fortunes have changed. I think fortunes have changed. When we move down to verse 31, in between he writes a letter to the governor telling him what's happening. Verse 31. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. My, my, my. Now, Paul comes into the city with 70 cavalrymen, horsemen, as his... See, they're not, they're not coming because he's a violent person and they're trying to protect people from him. They're protecting him from the people. Come on. They're protecting him from the people. Why? 
because he's got citizenship in Rome. Only because he's a Rome, not because I respect human life, not because I respect because he's a rabbi, not because of anything other than one thing alone. He is a Roman citizen. And they will put at his disposal whatever military might is required to deliver one man safely from point A to point B. Wow. That's pretty important. Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. That puts something in motion. Man, they are not going to flog him. They are not going to beat him. They have no right to. They have no right to. Amen? They're going to protect him uh, and, 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 and put him to a point where he can, can get on trial. Now, let me, let me bring that to the next thing that he did. When he's on trial, no, he was in Caesarea for several years. And at one point when he's giving his his defense before the, the, uh, the, the governor, people ask sometimes, why was, why was Paul so long there? Why did the governor say, okay, we'll hear from you later, and it was another six months? The governor was looking for a bribe. It's very clear. He, he was hoping Paul would give him money, because that was, again, what, what happened in those days. But Paul already had a word from God. The word from God was, you're going to stand before Caesar. And so in the midst of one of those trials, when things were kind of up, Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. Those words came out of his mouth. I appeal to Caesar. And it was Felix or the other one, I'm not sure which one, said afterwards, you know, this man could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. But he appealed to Caesar, then to Caesar he's going to go. What was he doing? He was exercising his right as a Roman citizen that every Roman citizen under trial had the right to appeal to the supreme authority in the Roman Empire, Caesar. Caesar. So you could stand there, you don't like the judge because he doesn't like you, He's, this trial's going the wrong way, you, you think they're not being fair, you had a right as a Roman citizen, any Roman citizen, to stand in that court and say, I appeal to Caesar. Bingo, off to Caesar you went. Hmm? Today we're going to try you, find you guilty, you're going to appeal to the appeals court, then maybe to the Supreme Court, same kind of concept, except in Roman citizenship, you had the right to appeal directly to Caesar. I appeal to Caesar. Amen? Let me give you another thing that. Paul's there and they look like they, they're not being friendly to him. Either. What does he say? I appeal the blood of the Lamb. See, we're in a different, we're not citizens of Rome. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. What is our right to appeal? The ultimate appeal is the blood of the Lamb that washes away my sin. It covers it. So that when sickness comes or something and the devil might say, you have no right, I appeal. I appeal to the blood of the Lamb. Because the, de the devil's the one that comes with condemnation. You still with me now? Now watch this. In the onslaught of the enemy, the church has been trained to be silent. There is a time for silence and a time for speaking. We read that in Ecclesiastes 3.7. Yeshua demonstrates the time for silence. It is when to open his mouth would cause the will of God to be thwarted. But the church has been trained to be silent when we should be speaking. Hmm? We should be speaking about sickness. We should be speaking in the midst of famine. We should be speaking in the midst of poverty. We should instantly speak when discouraging news comes. Oh, well, I'm stretched out here and about to get flogged. I guess uh, this must be God's will. Ah, this must be God's will. I'm not going to say anything. When you're a citizen, you're not going to say anything? That's ignorance gone to seed, as Brother Hagin would say. It's stupidity. Why would you take a beating when all you have to say is, Do you, is it lawful to beat a Roman citizen? And the answer is, no, it isn't. We didn't know you were, and the beating isn't going to take place. Why would you ever take sickness and say, oh well, the doctor says this, doctor says I gotta die, doctor says I have this disease, it's fatal, the banker says, you know, I've gotta file for bankruptcy, the lawyer says there's no hope for this, my relatives and everybody say I'll never amount to anything. Why would you ever get in agreement with that instead of saying, no, stop, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God and I have a right. And the right is this, the Bible says by his stripes I was healed. 
Come on. The Bible says. The Bible says. And I'm going to start lining up, and that's what Paul did. He started lining up everything he said from that point on with his rights as a citizen. Wow. And yet the church, as I said, has trained us to be silent. Under difficulties, bear up and say nothing. <laughs> Actually, by the way, that's better than complaining or giving an account of what the devil does do is to say nothing. But the fact is, you and I are speaking spirits in the kingdom of God. And we are meant to be decreeing and saying how things are going to be. Truth is, you are saying how things are going to be. You're calling what is as though it is, and it remains as though it is. But if you call things that are not as though they are, that's what, what the example of faith is in the book of Romans, that, that Abraham called himself a father when yet Sarah wasn't pregnant. Call me father. He told everyone else, call me father. Call me father. Are you not a father yet? Call me father. Call me father. Call me debt free. Well, you're not debt free. You still owe money. Call me debt free. Call me debt free. I call me debt free. How can you call yourself debt free? That's a lie because you still owe money. Is it a lie when God said to do it? Or is it that we don't understand what it means to decree a thing? That's that principle I started with in the beginning that absolutely amazes me. There are people in the world who aren't Christians who understand that principle and use it. You call things into existence. You speak what is to be and it will be. You decree and declare a thing and it will be. And all over the blogs and all over the internet people write, oh, this is heresy, this isn't so. But they're broke, they're sick, they're dying, and they're still saying, well, you never know what God's will is. I do know what God's will is. I got a copy of his will. You do too. That's his will. <laughs> I was listening to Brother Keith Moore preaching a message on 30... 30 reasons why it's God's will to heal you. And he said, you know, people say, well, I don't believe it. He said, well, that's okay to, if you don't want to believe it, but give me some Bible. Give me even five verses that say it's God's will that you suffer and die. Give me even five. Let's, we're called Bible Christians. Let's have a biblical discussion. But Bible Christians who want to fight that have no Bible to give you. Well, but why did Aunt Mildred die? Aunt Mildred isn't in the Bible. <laughs> Come on. I've got some close people in my life that I've pushed on that issue. And when I finally come to the end of it, they'll say, yeah, but what about so-and-so? He was a dear saint and we all prayed. Well, you must have missed it somewhere. But here we are having a Bible discussion with the Bible teaches. And in every area of your life you say, I believe what the Bible teaches. Give me one verse that says it's God's will. One time when Yeshua said to somebody, it's not God's will to heal you. No. Yeshua, would you heal me? No, it's not God's will to heal you. One point where Yeshua said, uh, well, you never know. We don't know what God's will. Let's stop and pray. Let's find out what God's will is. No, that's religious garbage that comes up in the body of Christ to steal your rights as a citizen. Your rights as a citizen. See, your rights as a citizen do not make you arrogant. They're just your rights. Amen? You have rights. Yeshua paid the price. He bore the curse of the law. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29. Everything in there that's a curse, Yeshua already paid it. Remember what? He's coming here trying to put the curse of the law on me, but Tim paid it. He's trying to tell me I owe him $1,000. Tim paid it. The devil comes to put anything in Deuteronomy 28 and 29 on you that's a curse of the law. You got a document that says Yeshua paid it. So why aren't you complaining about that? Why aren't you getting mad about that? Jumping up and down saying, this isn't right. You have no right to steal from me. You have no right to take that away from me. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's not a time for wimps. Wimps are going to get flogged. Come on. Bold people are going to say, wait, stop. I'm a citizen. And you have no legal right to put that on me. Well, the devil said, yeah, but you know you've sinned. I know. Who hasn't? You don't get healed because you're living a perfect life. You get healed by the mercy and grace of God. And because you believe. One thing only. You believe. You believe. Come on, as a citizen of America, I have rights as a citizen, whether I'm a good citizen or bad citizen. They're my rights. I have a right to a, to a trial by jury. Whether I'm a good man or bad man. 
I have, I, you know, I, I can be as guilty as any, but I have a right to a trial by jury. I can be innocent. I have a right to a trial by jury. You can be living an excellent uh, Christian life. You can live in a Christian life where, man, the Holy Spirit has to beat you over the head every other hour to keep you in shape. But that has nothing to do with your rights as a child of God. Somebody already paid for something. Why are you paying it again? Amen? I don't need to be discouraged. I don't need to be down. I don't need to get old and die. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Listen. So when the enemy comes to exact the penalty on us, why are we silent? It's not the time for silence. Decree it and declare it. Decree it and declare it. You need a job, decree it and declare it. It's there. I don't care what the employment, unemployment rate is in, in, in this country. It makes absolutely nothing. Come on. We have examples in our own congregation. People lose a job one day and three days later they're out and got another job. Don't tell me it can't happen. And a better one than the one they lost. It's happening right in our own midst. It's what do you believe are your rights? And then you go look to exercise those rights. Yeshua bore our sicknesses according to Isaiah 53. He bore our poverty. So what do you say? Why would we be silent? Why don't we say, hey, 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 whoa, stop. You know, somebody comes and says, wait a minute, you know, we're going to take this from you, or, or this is what the doctor's report or the finance report is. Whoa, 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 stop. That's not the final report. I appeal to the Word of God. I appeal to my rights as a citizen. Hey, devil, is it legal for you to inflict a sickness on a citizen of the kingdom of God when that sickness has been paid for? Hey, devil, you got a bill you can't pay. Hey, devil, is it legal for you to inflict poverty on a citizen of the kingdom of God when that poverty has been paid for? If it's under the curse of the law, then it's illegal for the devil to inflict it upon you. But who has the responsibility to enforce the law? Ah, who has a responsibility? I cannot enforce the law for you. I cannot enforce the law for you. I cannot stay there and say, she says, <laughs> no, you have to speak. I, I, I can't go to the doctor's office with you and sit there and the doctor utters some negative thing. I can't say, well, she says that's not so. My words do not affect anything for you. In, in, in terms of your rights as a citizen. I cannot exercise your rights as a citizen. Any more than when I'm performing a marriage and I, I turn to the man, do you take this, this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? And he sits there silent and she says, he does. I don't care if he's shy, timid, stage struck or whatever. I got to have words out of him. You know, three months later comes up and says, well, you know, I never said I do. And the witness says, you know, he's right. Now that you say it, pastor, he never said I do. You know, or, or the father in the back of the church with a shotgun said, he does. No, I, I can't marry them on the basis of what the man with the shotgun says or what the woman that's standing there says. I got to have words out of his mouth. Amen. God can't do anything if you will not exercise your mouth to speak who you are in the face of the enemy. Absolutely amazing. So Paul says, is it lawful? Is it lawful? Is it lawful to flog a Roman citizen without a trial? And we say, is it lawful to put this on a citizen of the kingdom of God when it's been paid for? If you don't say, I'm healed, who will? If you don't say, all my needs are met, who will? If you don't say, all is well with my life, who will? Yeah, but pastor, all isn't well. Mm hmm I know it isn't. And it's going to stay not well. Come on, remember the Shunammite woman? Her son dies in the field, comes up, puts him on the prophet's bed up there. She, she goes immediately and says to the servants, saddle my donkey, I need to get to the prophet right away. She's coming in a hurry, obviously out of the house, and her own husband says to her, is all well? She says, all is well gets on the donkey and rides like mad to the, to, the, uh, to the prophet, and the prophet's servant comes out and says, Ma'am, is all well? All is well. She gets to the prophet, and the prophet says, Is all well? She says, 
all is well. Nowhere in there does she say, my son has died. When she says to the prophet, all is well. You said. And now she calls to the words about the promise that was in that said. You said that my son would be a this, would be a this, would be a this. And the prophet realizes right away, something's wrong with the son. Okay? And he goes to take care of it. But she nowhere says, it's not well. I can't tell you how many people in the years of my ministry have heard this teaching and don't, and there's a disconnect. I hear them. I walk into the hospital and they say, well, it doesn't look good. Well, the doctor says, you know, there's only two weeks to live. You know, I give up. I don't know what to say. Where's the decreeing and the declaring? Not even the doctor says, but I say this. That it just ends with, here's what the doctor says. Well, you know, pastor, what am I going to do? I lost my job. Is that your declare? I have no job? Is that what you're decreeing and declaring? I have no job? I mean, you know, excuse me. Exercise our rights as citizens of the kingdom of God. Who's going to say all is well in my life if you don't? If you don't call out your rights as a citizen of the kingdom, who will? What kind of a kingdom are you part of? See, how big is this kingdom? I'll tell you, it's bigger than all the blogs in the world put together. We're citizens. You know, I might be a citizen of Ashburnham, but I'm a citizen of, of America. You know, someone can be, I'm a citizen of Beverly Hills, but we're both citizens of America. Amen? You can be, be citizens of America living in, a, in a, a less prosperous community or the most prosperous community, but what do you have in common? We're citizens of America. Okay? Well, we're citizens of the kingdom of God. And then we have rights. And when the devil comes to flog us, come on, when the devil comes to flog us, what do you say? I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Somebody gives you a bad news report, first word out of your mouth. Say something like, well, you understand, doctor, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Well, you understand, banker, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Boss comes in and says, you're fired. You say, well, you know, you need to understand something. First and foremost, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. And he's my employer. You never were. <laughs> Amen. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. If bad news comes over the TV, something's going, this is bad, this is, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Palestinians want to do whatever they want, war breaks out in the Middle East, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. The economy's going to collapse, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's true, but I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. In other words, I have rights in this very planet that others do not have. Come on, Paul had rights in Jerusalem that most people living in Jerusalem did not have. They could just grab anyone, put them there, and flog them and get information out of them. But Paul's there, and he says, is it right to flog a citizen of the kingdom of Rome? A Roman citizen without a trial? Well, we didn't know you were a Roman citizen. In the midst of a, a, of a city filled with people who weren't Roman citizens, come on, most of the soldiers in the army were not Roman citizens. Huh? And some, remember, as the guy says, I had to buy mine. How did you get yours? Huh? He was astounded. You're a Roman citizen? You have, but immediately he knew something. Ah, in this world where I can go out and grab anybody I want, bring them into my barracks, beat them, flog them, treat them in any way, I grabbed a person out in the middle of this riot and found out I grabbed a, a Roman citizen. Oh my goodness, he has rights. I, I need to back off because he's standing up for his rights. The devil will treat you the same way. If he can get you to be silent when you should be speaking, remember a season for silence and a season for speaking. Come on, Ecclesiastes. This is the season for speaking, for decreeing, for declaring. Not thinking, speaking. Who do you say you are? Who do you say you are? Doesn't make any difference how young you are. You learn this. Doesn't make any difference how old some of us are. <laughs> we still learn it. Come on, what's a good life? 90 years? Oh, wow, that would be a really great, great life. 90 years. 80? 70? 60? You know, there's people that think 60 is a good life. There's several of us in here who would disagree with you. <laughs> Amen. You know, I mean, there's a lot more to see and do and be. 
Come on. And then I hear people say, well, you know, they might have died early, but they lived a full life. Forty years? A full life? God must have had a reason to take them. God didn't do the taking, and it wasn't a full life. Come on, 40. Bible says that we can live to 120. That's the norm. Doesn't mean you can't live beyond it. You can, but 120 is what God said are to be the years of a man's life. 120 is what he said are to be the life years of a man. Well, I don't see very many people. Why? Because we've talked ourselves down. We've talked ourselves down. We've called 60 old. Well, no wonder people don't make it to 120 if you call 60 old. We retire at 65. Excuse me, you should get refired. Refired at 65, not retired at 65. So we program people to wear out. We program people to wear out. But you get into cultures where people do live up into the 90s and 100, and you find out they don't talk about old age. They don't talk about getting old. In fact, in most of those cultures, people have no idea of retirement. Come on, there's no social security or anything. You work until you leave. <laughs> you know, and working at 85, maybe taking care of the children, it may be mending, it may be weaving rugs. I don't know what it is, but, but, there's, but there's no talk in the society about getting old and dying. But in our culture, we talk about getting old and die, and we find old gets younger and younger and younger. No, what are we decreeing and declaring? We're citizens of a kingdom, and we have to start exercising our rights. So when a thought comes to you, say, hey, is it legal for you to try to put that thought on me, a citizen of the kingdom of God? And watch what the devil does. You get a bad report, you say, hey, 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 Satan, whoa, 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 wait a minute before you lay that on me. Is it right for you to lay on me, a citizen, a child of the kingdom of God, what Jesus already paid for? No, you have no right to do that, so I'm not going to take it. Nope, you delivered it to my door. Nope, I don't want it. I'm not going to entertain those thoughts. I'm not going to walk that kind of a life. Amen? Do you have any right to put that on me, a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God? No, you don't. I'm claiming my rights. I'm speaking my rights. I'm speaking it. I'm speaking it. Come on. Are we on the same page? This is a time to be silent and a time to be speaking. This is the season for speaking, not the season for silence. 